Uh, we're going to get down to it now. So what's uh, what will happen is that uh, we'll get the bird out of the cage, hopefully without event and uh, without any show of uh, physical frailty on my part. And uh, we'll get some pictures. We want to get Brian's picture with this bird since he, he knows this bird on a first name basis. And as they say, he knew it back when. Uh, we'll do that, but then we'll also, as is our custom, uh, walk around with the bird before we release it so everybody can get their close-up shots. But uh, then we'll separate, and I'm going to launch the bird down that way, away from the river. I mm -hmm. hope the breeze is going to carry it away from the river, but we'll see. I've long ago stopped predicting which way they're going to fly uh, or what they're going to do. I will say, though, just as a one of my standard disclaimers, if this bird flies out 50 feet and sits on the ground, let it be. Uh, it's been in a box for three hours now. It hasn't stretched in a while, and it has been in a cage that's 85 feet long for a while. Some of them take a minute to recognize that they are, in fact, free and can fly farther than 85 feet without hitting a wall. <laughs> Although this bird, being what this bird is, I don't think that's likely to be our issue. Uh, before we get absorbed in what we're doing here, any questions or comments or observations? Yes. Name. I'm Ed Clark. <laughs> no, we, we don't name the birds. No, not, we, we don't do that. We, we, each of them has a number. Uh, the, the ones in our education program get a name, but not, not our patients. Just call it Rachel. Well, you can call it anything you want. If it hurts me, I may call it some things you haven't thought of yet. <laughs> How long does it take it to get white feathers? Uh, they get their white head and white tail during the molt of their fourth year. About four and a half years old, they'll start that process when they become mature. One of the reasons it's so important to know what Brian and his team are studying and some of the types of clinical studies we're doing, it takes an eagle a long time to become reproductive. Uh, you know, with some of the smaller animals, they're born one year and they start making babies sometime <laughs> before that year's out, but certainly by the next year. But with eagles, they've got to survive really five years. Is that, would that be a fair statement, five years or more? Yeah, and their reproductive rate continues to go up for another five years, so they don't re re peak reproduction until they're probably 10 years old. And the attrition rate by the time they reach 10 would be what? Uh, they have about a 10% mortality rate once they reach uh, adulthood. So. But and then what is it, about 75% of juveniles uh, fail before they reach adulthood? Is that yeah, more. Yeah, more so it's about 80% of the ones hatched do not make it to adulthood, and then the mortality rate once they get to be adults is about 1 out of 10 per year. So it takes a lot bring them back. It has taken a team effort here in Virginia. Uh, the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are the, the government agencies that oversee it, but for, for many years, uh, College of William and Mary and uh, the Center for Conservation Biology, uh, Brian's predecessor, Dr. Mitchell Bird, who is a, truly one of the great conservationists of the state of Virginia and anywhere as far as that goes. Those of us who have known him and worked with him are, are very, very fortunate to have been exposed to that kind of expertise and dedication. But Brian is the, uh, the heir to that leadership, and his, his group is just doing some incredible, incredible work. And the partnerships that we have with William and Mary, the, the collaboration we do with the Game Department, with the Fish and Wildlife Service, it has taken many, many people and millions of dollars to pull our national symbol back from the brink of extinction. But we have done it. And now, as, as Brian said, 615 nests in the coastal plain of Virginia, and uh, probably, well, some estimates I've heard as many as 100 more out in our neck of the woods, out uh, in the, the non-tidal rivers. And uh, that's, that's quite a remarkable success story. And it proves that acts like the Endangered Species Act, Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, and, and other measures to protect these birds do work when we care enough to make them work. And uh, the eagle represents that well. All right, any other questions before we get down to, yes? Any statistics on how well these release eagles do? Good question. I'm going to get you prime him. <laughs> One of the things that you'll see on this bird is the band that Brian put on years ago, but it also has a new purple band on, which is a research band. That band uh, is visible, so if the bird were sitting in the tree up here or over there, with a good pair of binoculars or a spotting scope, you could read the research band. The number's quite large. There are only two, two digits on it. And that gives us uh, a very, actually two letters, I think, on, on the bands. That gives us the idea of which bird this is. The color purple is for the state of Virginia. The, the two digits give us the ability to very quickly, without going through the feds, 
to find out which this bird is because really to read the small band that Brian put on, you've got to have your hands on the bird. And that's not easy to do with uncooperative adults. Yeah, Deb. And what is this bird? We'll find out when he comes Yeah, we'll, yeah. <laughs> it'll be a surprise for all of us. It was done before I picked him up this morning, so uh, we'll all find out at the same time. One of the things we will soon be doing to answer that question, and unfortunately the, the equipment didn't come in in time to do this bird, is we will be starting to put patagial wing markers on eagles that are being released. And that is, uh, the patagium is, is the, what is it, it's a ligament that goes between the shoulder and the wrist joint so that that plane of skin and feathers that creates the aerodynamic surface for the wing, it's just skin. It's like the webbing of your fingers. And so a, a soft marker uh, will be put over that, and, and I, I'll, I'll say stapled or riveted in place, but that's not exactly what it is. So, we, you know, we're not using a staple gun on these guys, but it will be fastened there. It doesn't impede the bird's uh, flight or ability to do anything that eagles do and eventually just falls right off. But it will be the sort of thing that if you see an eagle flying out there with a pair of binoculars, you can get a color image off that bird. And the way that uh, our colleague Jeff Cooper, who is in charge of the non-game program for the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, the way he's now planning is, is he will get a specific color and marker that is dedicated exclusively to birds that have undergone rehabilitation. Uh, and actually, uh, we recently uh, had the, the biologists from the state who are out going to be out this winter catching eagles uh, to draw blood samples and do other uh, studies. Uh, Dave and his team were teaching them how to properly handle the birds and, and especially to draw blood uh, and not have them draw blood from you back. Uh, but that uh, program is, is going to be going on, and, and some of the things that uh, he was saying is we hope to eventually get some radio collars, or not collars, I'm get mammals on the brain, uh, radio tags uh, to put on transmitters, that's where I'm grappling for, to put on some of the released eagles to really see how they've done. And so it'll be an interesting, uh, interesting thing when we get to it, because we really don't know. At the Botanical Gardens. Well, anyway, I mean, you know, in our immediate area here. Yeah, I, I think we we may have to put another satellite transmitter at the Botanical Gardens. We have 65 transmitters out right now. Uh, these are very sophisticated pieces of equipment. They have GPS units um, on board, and those GPS units are taking fixes every hour during the day on these birds, and it. Uh, collects those fixes into a database and it transmits the database through satellite to us. And so these 65 birds are generating about 900 fixes a day, locations a day. And so we have logged over 400,000 locations of these birds throughout the mid-Atlantic. And so they're teaching us, these birds are like probes, teaching us um, how they're using the Chesapeake Bay relative to human, you know, uh, development and other factors. So they're great tools. I know that they fall off eventually. Have you had a success rate of retrieving them before the battery goes out? Um, yeah, these are solar powered. So there's a, there's a solar panel on the back of these transmitters, and so they're recharging. And so as long as it's upright, uh, it'll continue to transmit as long as it's not in the water. Yeah, we have recovered uh, mm -hmm. some of these units. Okay. They're, they're worth recovering. They're yeah. about $4,000 <laughs> $4, a piece. So, um, it's not cheap, but they're able to tell us things that no other... Um, technique that we have you can tell us so. well and uh, I, I don't know if it's still classified or not but I'm going to tell it anyway that these, these uh, transmitters were actually developed by the Defense Department uh, to, to do very specialized uh, I'll just be general about it surveillance uh, over the old Soviet Union and they use migratory birds and quantitative analysis of the fibers the barbules on the feathers uh, they would monitor a bird as it came down, knowing the growth rate of certain feathers. Uh, they could take literally each little fiber of that feather and do a quantitative analysis on it and find out when radiation levels reached a certain point, certain other chemical levels came, and by simply going back to these types of cross-referencing, uh, they were able to tell whether there were secret weapons programs and that kind of thing. Well. Soviet Union went away, but the technology had, as with many other forms of research technology, has had application in the scientific field. I mean, one of the, some of the things we've done most recently to study whales has been sonar technology developed to find enemy submarines, and now we're learning a tremendous amount about marine mammals using that same technology.